Okay. All right. All right. Let everyone join. All right, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight as for an awesome and very important webinar on backcountry safety and avalanche terrain. I'm Liz from over at the Mountain Shop, and joining me tonight is Christopher Van Tilburg, who is the medical director of Portland Mountain Rescue and a rescue mountaineer with Hood River Crag Rats. He's also the author of Backcountry Ski and Snowboard Routes, Oregon. Thanks for joining us, Christopher. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So Christopher, Christopher will be giving us an inside look at his avalanche safety precautions, starting with the morning as he packs his pack, packs his gear into his pack to the end of the day ski touring on Mount Hood. This day in the life avalanche awareness talk will get you started on everything from avalanche safety classes, safety equipment such as an airbag pack, techniques at safe uphill travel, and low risk downhill turns. Questions are welcome and encouraged. Please use the Q&A function for questions. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can during the presentation. The presentation tonight is brought to you by The Mountain Shop and Portland Mountain Rescue. It will be recorded and shared in the next day or so. And without further ado, I'll hand things over to Christopher. Okay, thanks very much, Liz. Um, and welcome everybody. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk tonight and uh, represent Portland Mountain Rescue. I feel really fortunate that I'm uh, a member of such a great uh, group of um, avid mountaineers and rescue mountaineers. So uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I think I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes or so, maybe a tiny bit longer than that, and I'm going to cover some basic avalanche awareness uh, topics. I'm kind of going to go through basically what I do before I go out ski touring or uh, climbing a mountain. And so let me see if I can get my screen shared here. There we go. That coming through okay, Liz? Yeah, okay. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna kind of go a little bit fast, but if I see a question pop up, I'm happy to uh, stop. So um, let me see if I can, there we go. So um, avalanches occur in the mountains year round and, and they sometimes surprise us and sneak up on us. This is a picture I took uh, while I was on the chairlift at Mount Bachelor. I was actually down there doing some research on a person who died in a tree well and I was riding up the chairlift with the ski patrol director and this avalanche happened about um, a minute or two before I took this picture. Inbounds, those skiers you see are um, skiers inbounds uh, at Mount Bachelor. And so avalanches happen inbounds and out of bounds. Many of you might recognize this. This is uh, Heather Canyon at, um, in Mount Hood Meadows in the permit area. And this is why Heather Canyon is closed um, when, um, when, we, when we wanna ski it. And this is on the left here, that's Pea Gravel Ridge. And on the right, that's um, the bottom of uh, Half Moon Bowl, Moon Bowl. But this avalanche, this picture is taken about from about 12 years ago. This is from the Y East face. So this avalanche is, it's a known avalanche zone and this slides every two or three years. And when it slides, it slides big. And this comes from the Y East face, which is between nine and 11,000 feet uh, on the east side of Mount Hood. And it slides all the way to the Heather Canyon chair. And this same avalanche uh, is in this picture, it's about 20 feet deep, the debris pile. And it's in this picture, this is Heather Canyon in August, and this is about the um, bottom of Heather Canyon chairlift. And so um, this snow is still 10 feet deep in August from that slide. So avalanches happen. We have about uh, 25 to 27 deaths per year, unfortunately. We don't really know why we've had these low years a few times. That 2016, 2017 year, was uh, really very few fatalities, but that was the year we had um, snow in Hood River and Portland. We had Hood River snow in Hood River for three months, snow in Portland for about a month and a month and a half, and so that was a big snow year, and so we're not really sure why. We do know that 
uh, backcountry tours and snowmobilers are the most at risk. So when I when you look at this data, this is from the last 10 years. So this is backcountry tours really is skiers, snowboarders, snowshoers, and even some cross country skiers. So snowmobilers, backcountry tours are the are the biggest groups of people that die. The climbers and side country ride riders are the next two. Now, so side country, this is a really important designation which we try to teach people. Side country is when you buy a lift ticket or you skin up, uphill inbounds legally and then you go out of bounds, duck a rope either legally or illegally, you duck a rope or um, or go through a control gate. Uh, and the reason this is important is if you're going backcountry skiing, say on the south boundary of Mount Hood Meadows in the Vista Ridge um, Meadows, that's the backcountry. That's not the side country. So a lot of people think, oh, it's the side country. It's near a ski resort, but it's not. Um, and unfortunately, on this graph, you can see we've had uh, um, inbounds skiers and snowboarders that have been killed also, unfortunately. Colorado is the state with the most fatalities. Washington is tied for second. So that's a, uh, we've got a lot of avalanche terrain in the state of Washington. And then Oregon is in the last 10 years, so less than one per year, which we're lucky. Cause of death is 25% is trauma. So we kind of um, forget about this sometimes, but uh, trauma is a quarter of all the deaths. And so that's people smacking a tree or tumbling in avalanche debris. And then uh, people who suffocate when they're buried is three quarters of the cause of death. And so this graph, I, I wanted to show this because this, I wanted to show this mostly because um, when we are dealing with, like, for example, the pandemic, we are, a lot of us, including myself, are reading social media and there's so much misinformation um, and some of it, you know, unintentional on social media. So I want to put in a couple, like, uh, scientific pieces in this talk tonight. So this, what this represents is if you're buried under the snow and you're buried and, you're, and your buddy's able to dig you out within 15 minutes, you have a 90% chance of survival. So that's this right up here. So 15 minutes, you have about a 90% chance of survival. Um, this, um, and so but if you're buried for longer than 30 minutes, you can see your chance of survival really plummets. And so this is the reason this is important is your partner's the one that's gonna rescue you and you may have to rescue your partner. So that we call this companion rescue. But if you're gonna call Portland Mountain Rescue, if we have a team on the mountain, which we do during uh, a lot of weekends, the busy climbing season, we may be able to get there sooner. Ski patrol, if you're adjacent to a ski resort, may be able to get there sooner. But mostly, you're looking at you're looking at a professional rescue response. You're out here in the one or two hour range. Um, okay, so that's the background. I'm going to talk about kind of the five things that I do before I go on a tour: equipment, training, forecast, safety, and rescue. And so these are um, kind of the five things that I think are the most important. Uh, for knowing before you go. So the first thing is uh, getting gear, learning how to use it and practicing with it. So learning how to use your gear and practicing with your gear, are two separate things. So if you buy it and you throw it in your pack, uh, it might not do a lot of good. So take a class, formal class, learn how to use it and practice. So I also tell people, I'm going to talk just briefly in a second about beacons, but a beacon, if you're not familiar with that, that's a small electronic transceiver that broadcasts a, sing a signal uh, roughly 40 to 50 meters and if you're buried your partner can turn his or her beacon to search mode and come find you and so these are um, uh, you know basically small computers it's a they're um, and so uh, this person here well, I see this a lot in the spring and summer we're pretty fortunate that we can ski all year and we have a lot of, we have a big ski mountaineering season in the spring and summer because of our, our beautiful volcanoes. But this, per, what I see people wearing their beacon on the outside of their shirt a lot. And this is, if you're caught in an avalanche, it's one, likely to get torn off and two, likely to be damaged. And so you have to really be careful and protect 
your equipment, especially the electronics. And so I carry my beacon in my left front pocket. And I wouldn't recommend that for most people. I would say mostly you want to put it in the harness it comes with, like this person. But um, but I oftentimes have a, a rescue radio or I work at the ski resort, so I have a ski resort radio on my chest and I have a cell phone on my chest. And so I want to have some distance between the electronics. So um, we get a question a lot uh, when we do safety talks as rescuers, you know, what's the, what are the most important things um, that people can prepare themselves? One is stay found. So know where you are at all times. And you can use a cell phone app like this, uh, or use Cal Topo. Uh, and so know where you are and be able to call us and tell us what the problem is. That's huge for us. And then uh, try to carry enough gear to spend the night. So and this doesn't mean you're going to have a giant pack, but if you at least have the skills to build a snow cave and a couple extra layers, uh, that's going to be really important. I'm I'm one of those guys that I take the same stuff every time I go out. I mean, I ski all winter long, and I just I get home, dry my gear, put it back in my pack, and I take the same stuff almost um, every time. I might, there's a few exceptions. I might sometimes throw in ski crampons or little things like that. This is, but this is the stuff I'm using this year. So I'm using, uh, I have a can, I have this uh, probe, which is a 2.4 meter collapsible probe. And so uh, I'm going to talk about that in a bit towards the end. And I'm going to, and I use, um, I'm using this peeps, a really, this is a really very compact shovel with a non telescopic handle. That's not the um, most efficient way to move snow, but it's very compact and light. And then I have this uh, peeps micro beacon and I'm using the Scott E1 Patrol airbag pack. So I've used a lot of different types of airbag packs. They're all really good. Um, the important distinction between these two pictures is this stuff on the left, we always think of avalanche safety as beacon shovel probe as the primary safety tools. I'm a little bit on a mission to kind of change that. And the reason is, is these, are, these are definitely the primary safety tools, but these tools you're gonna pull out if somebody's buried. Whereas this tool, the airbag pack, is gonna prevent you from getting buried. And so it's, unfortunately they're expensive and, um, and they're heavy, um, but uh, it's definitely a tool that's gonna save, save lives. So this is a close up of the beacon. If you're looking for a beacon and you haven't bought one yet, Mountain Shop has rentals, which is a fabulous idea you can run. You can shovel probe package for three days or 30 days, I think. Um, and these are all good. Most of what you want in a beacon is you want the uh, three antennas uh, digitally processed and you really, if possible, want this marking function on here. This little flag allows me to suppress a signal uh, if there's a multiple burial situation. And I mentioned you have to practice with this stuff. It's really important to practice with your beacon and you don't have to be in, on snow to practice. You can have your buddy hide a beacon in your house and go search for it, hide in your backyard. I was up, I've been up uh, on the mountain a lot this year already and I was on the top of Palmer, halfway up to Crater Rock and I stopped, I was with my friends, we were taking a break and I just switched my beacon to receive mode and walked past um, about 25 people at the top of Palmer having lunch. And I just, see i just walked up to people to see who had a beacon and who didn't and so you know getting to know your equipment and using it is important i'm not going to talk much about the avalon or the air diverter other than to mention that this is um it's no longer available but if, you know, i want to mention in case people have questions but you can't get this in the u.s this is a this is a um uh strap to a backpack strap and allows you to breathe under the snow if you're buried by um keeping you from rebreathing your expired breath. Um, you, there are, I have guide friends that are using both an airbag pack like this one. This is a pack I used last year. This is a Freno pack, it's Italian, but this, I wanted to show you just because I want people to know that there is a lot that goes into safety and it's more than just buying a beacon shovel probe and sticking it in your pack. This is a airbag uh, handle on the left. So it has an airbag and then this is the air diverter on the right. And so, um, and this is how it uh, looks when it's deployed. And so this is, um, it's a heavy pack, but it's, it, uh, it's for maximum uh, safety. If you've heard about the RECO, you might have ski pants that have a RECO sewn in them, or maybe ski boots or snowboarding boots. 
So the RECO is, uh, used to be exclusive for the ski industry and now uh, it's being marketed to mountain bikers and hikers. And so it's a little diode that um, is sewn into clothing and the rescue team has to have this um, handheld transceiver. So Port Mountain Rescue has one, Timberline Ski Patrol, Mountain Hood Meadow Ski Patrol have these. And there's a few aviation um, units in the United States that have this uh, large RECO receiver. But basically it's like a speed gun from, a, for, from the state patrol. They, it's, you send out a beam and it pucks off the RECO diode and it comes back and it gives you sort of a direction and distance. But it's a, the reason why it's important is this is for a professional rescue. So this isn't for companion rescue. So that's an important distinction. Uh, finally, I recommend wearing a helmet. You know, as, as I mentioned, 25% of all trauma is, um, is 25% um, of all avalanche fatalities are trauma. So I, I wear this really light uh, ski mountaineering um, race helmet. It's basically a hunk of styrofoam. It's, it's rated for rockfall. I wouldn't, I don't take this if I'm, I know I'm doing a summit climb in Mount Hood, but I take this if I'm skiing and it's so light it fits inside my pack and I just always remember to have it and that's why I like it. It's a little bit of a trade-off like all equipment. You want it light enough so you bring it, but, um, but you also want it strong enough to protect you. Um, so finally, with equipment, I mentioned this already, it's really important to practice. This is a snow cave I built in my backyard in Salt Lake City when I was living there in 1997. And I built this after I took a class on how to build snow caves. And uh, I was in my backyard, I built it in the afternoon and I slept in my bed because the next morning I woke up and this is what happened. So it's really important to, to, to practice. And I built this snow cave incorrectly, which is why it collapsed. Okay, so that's quick and dirty on gear. Uh, let's talk about education. So the, the, these are two of the um, United States um, bodies that kind of certify or promote education. And so generally what we recommend is a level, what we call level one avalanche class. So that would be a three, usually a three day class, one day classroom, two days uh, in the field. And it's a, a really great, uh, uh, great course. I've ta I taught a couple last year. Um, it's fun, it's in the snow, it covers basically a three day version of what I'm talking about in this talk. So if you if you like to learn from books like I do, uh, there's a lot of books out there. I'm not preferential to any of them because all of us basically in the North America and in Europe are teaching the same fundamental safety topics. And so this is a book that I, this is my friend and colleague, Bruce Tremper, who um, uh, directed the Utah Avalanche Forecast Center for years. And, uh, but there's lots of books out there. So there's a lot of local knowledge you can get. This is a, I took this picture on the, this is, uh, if you're up at Whistler, Blackcomb, there's a canyon in between the two resorts. Uh, it's the canyon that the gondola goes over, and that canyon is out of bounds, and there's a ski tour. You can go right up the canyon. It's pretty gentle, and it's not super exciting, but this is, the, this is the board that's at the beginning of that ski tour. So there's lots of information here about avalanche pathways and how to be safe, and, and so local information is great. This is a picture that almost anybody can understand, right? So this is exiting the canyons uh, ski resort. So this is um, in Utah in the canyons and there's, uh, they allow you to buy a lift ticket and ski out of bounds. And so you have to go through this gate. So um, local knowledge is helping, is helpful. This is a really, really important sign for everybody on this call. And you might recognize this or you might not. This is a really important sign. So this is the sign that is about 100 meters from the Heather uh, Canyon parking lot, the parking lot at Hood River Meadows up the Heather Canyon uh, Road, the Heather Canyon um, Access Cat Track. So uh, this is important because of the howitzer program at Mount Hood Meadows. So this is, they, the Mount Hood Meadows allows you to ski up Heather Canyon about 100 meters when you get to the sign it's either going to say open or closed. If it's closed, then you have to exit Heather Canyon right then and there because that means they're um, shooting artillery uh, in Heather Canyon. And if it's open, you're only allowed to ski up to the next sign, which is um, about halfway to um, Jill's Woods. And so you have to exit 
Heather Canyon at this point. And so that's just important local knowledge um, to have when you're out and about. Okay, so I talked about uh, equipment. I talked about education. I'm gonna talk about forecasts. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I'm gonna tell you, this is what I do. I do this, unfortunately, almost every morning uh, when I wake up. First thing I do when I wake up, I look at these web pages to find out what's going on, even if I'm working um, at, uh, in my, in my uh, even if I'm going to work for three days and I know I'm not gonna be on the mountain, I still really like to follow the trends and the, and the weather and the snowpack. So, so I tend to um, check weather, I check the avalanche report, I check, uh, if I know I'm gonna climb one of the volcanoes, I'll try to get a hold of a climbing ranger if I can to get firsthand info. Mount Hood Meadows is an avalanche mitigation website you can check to see if they're actively um, uh, bombing Heather Canyon. And then uh, I actually use social media. I, you gotta be a little bit careful, but you know, especially if I'm climbing Mount Hood, or if I'm going up the south side, you, know, you can look on a variety of group posts and find out conditions on the south side from people who maybe just were up there the day before. Um, I do use it cautiously because, you know, if I get a report that says, oh, Pearly Gates left has a four foot ice step, you can get up there no problem with, with one tool and a whip it. You know, that might mean different things to different people, like what somebody might scramble up with one tool and a whip it, I might feel comfortable having two tools. So um, so it's just, it's just uh, use it cautiously. So these are the web pages I look at on the National Weather Service um, because that's where almost everybody gets their information. Um, any uh, A lot of secondary weather sources use uh, National Weather Service. So I look at the National Weather Service. I, I really study the telemetry data um, pretty closely. So you can get telemetry data from the National, the Northwest Avalanche Center. You can get it for, for example, um, Mount Hood Meadows has sensors on at the parking lot, at the top of Blue Chair, and at the top of Cascade. This is a picture of the sensors at the top of Blue Chair and the parking lot. Uh, Timberline has one at the top of the Magic Mile and at Timberline Lodge. I think Ski Bowl has a sensor. There's one on the north side at Red Hill. Uh, so there, so you can get. Um, you know, hourly weather information. You can see if it froze the night before, you can see the wind. Uh, I find it really useful. Um, I look at the radar briefly to see what's happening in the next two to four hours. I look at the avalanche forecast from Northwest Avalanche Center. This is, uh, we're really fortunate now that this is the second season that we've had a full-time paid forecaster for Mount Hood, and that's Peter Moore. And he's a good guy and a smart uh, avalanche forecaster. I skied with him a couple times this year already. And he, um, this is a new because prior to um, him being hired last season, we had um, some part-time observers and some ski, ski patrollers that helped contribute, but we had no full-time avalanche forecaster. So that, we're really lucky. Um, then I check mountainforecast.com. I really like this website. There's a sister website, I think it's called snowforecast.com, which is like geared for ski resorts. But I, I like this to look at the um, freezing level and um, the forecast for the next three or four days. So those are the wet, those are, that's what I look at regularly. Um, if you look at the avalanche forecast, this is a chart you're gonna see oftentimes. And so this is sort of a general, uh, warning uh, matrix for avalanche. It doesn't take into account, you know, micro changes from one slope to another, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but it, it can give you an overall um, description. And once a, or twice a year, we'll have extreme uh, avalanche conditions, and that's basically when you need to stay off everything. Um, I like uh, the, the avalanche centers in the U.S. use, um, especially ours, I like this, um, they, they, uh, they usually always report out above tree line, near tree line, and below tree line. I really like this because you can help to gauge whether you can, where you can find safe terrain. And as you all know, if you're backcountry enthusiasts, you know that the uh, weather in government camp can be raining in government camp and can be just howling wind and wind scoured bulletproof ice above Timberline. That's the extremes that we get. And I spend most of my time in the winter in between 5,000 to 7,000 feet because that's oftentimes where the best snow is. Um, okay, so I talked about 
um, uh, education. I talk about forecasting. I talk about gear. I want to talk about safe travel, and this is going to be quick because it's a. This could we could talk about this for an entire day, but this is really sort of the most important stuff. And so, when we when I when we think about traveling in avalanche terrain in the mountains, just in general, I think about weather, snowpack, terrain, and the human factor, right? And so, so weather warning sign. So. Avalanches occur with new snow, and when they build up um, slabs, we call those storm slabs, and so new snow can cause avalanches. Strong winds can deposit snow and cause avalanches. Oftentimes, they can move more snow than storms can bring in, so strong winds are a warning sign. In fact, when I was in um, Newton Canyon just Sunday, uh, we were skiing a four-inch um, a powder from a wind transport and it was not it hadn't snowed uh, you know for several days so uh, anytime we get rain or sun followed by cooling and then new snow that's a recipe for an avalanche so the the new snow sits on top of a really hard crust so those are kind of the conditions that are developing right now. We've got a couple layers of crust on the mountain right now from this beautiful you know, spring-like weather we've had. And so when we get another storm, it's going to be sitting on the crust from um, this week and two weeks ago. Um, so the other, the other weather sign is rapid warming or the freeze-thaw cycle. So we generally, I'm not going to go into the, details of how avalanches are formed, but we generally think of big slabs of snow that slide from either new snow or wind, like um, the, these first four, or the freeze-thaw cycle can set off avalanches. Those are the ones we see in the spring. So that's when the snow freezes hard overnight, bulletproof, and it warms up uh, to 60, 50, 60 degrees on the mountain and it turns to slush. And this happens like in April and May and we get a lot of um, loose snow avalanches. And so those are the weather warning signs. Snowpack warning signs are almost identical. So of course, if you see an avalanche, that's a warning sign, but new snow on a firm base, soft snow on a firm base, wind loading or cornices. Seems a little duplicative, the two lists but the reason it's important is that you know the weather is what's happening above us in the sky and the snowpack is what we're skiing on or snowshoeing on and so it's two different sets of clues that we need to assess uh, so here is a, a day where i was skiing and came across this avalanche this is uh, this year from i think um May ish, I think. And so this is uh, basically an illumination saddle looking uphill on the zigzag. So this is Crater Rock, the summit of Mount Hood is up here. And so this is a loose avalanche that came from up here and kind of slid around the corner. So, warning sign, of course, is when you see new avalanches. So, uh, it's really beyond the hour that we're going to, I'm going to talk, or the 45 minutes I'm going to talk to really go into detail about snowpack, but here's an example of, I took this picture uh, in the Vista Ridge Meadows out, uh, about a, two weeks ago. So here is about six inches of um, really great um, snow. And this layer right here is was like sugary type soft snow. It's basically, the technical term would be like facets, but this is some soft snow. And, um, and this is the slab where it broke. It broke right here. And then it broke uh, down here below. So the, the snow is uh, set up in layers. Um, so we talked about, I talked about weather. I talked about snowpack. Let's talk about terrain warning signs. So terrain. So here is sort of the piece that we can control the easiest. We can't control the weather. We can't control the snowpack, but we can control the terrain that we're on. So the most common slope angle for avalanches is 30 to 45 degrees. So lower than 30, unlikely side, higher than 45. It's going to be technical skiing, and oftentimes the snow doesn't stick on the slope. It can still slide. Um, I already talked about how elevation was uh, variable on Mount Hood. But aspect is different, too. So 
if you if you look at Mount Hood or even if you look at other areas you're skiing, the <clears throat> shaded north side side often stays cool and is somewhat protected from direct sun exposure. Whereas the south side, like if, for example on Mount Hood, White River Canyon, that popular snowshoe cross country ski area, can just get baked in the um, even in midwinter. So aspect makes a difference. Anchors are basically trees or rocks that kind of offer some, prevent the slope from sliding. So generally, if the trees are tight, they offer some protection from avalanches, especially if they're too tight to ski or snowshoe through. Um, terrain traps are a big problem. Uh, so these are, a train trap is basically when a small avalanche can cause a big consequence. For example, a small three or four foot slope slides and knocks you into a creek. That's what happened. That's how people get into trouble. For example, if they're skiing Yoda Bowl or um, uh, private reserve, uh, not private reserve, God's Wall and Mount Hood Meadows. And at the bottom, you have to cross a creek, right? So even a small slip and you can get dumped into the creek. So train traps. So here's three degrees. This slid, this is 28 degrees, it didn't slide. So under 30 is generally safe. You can bring a, a slope meter or an inclinometer. Uh, this picture is really old. This picture is from probably um, late 90s. And so I used to bring this with me and measure it because it's really hard to gauge snow slopes if you don't measure them. It's even for me, it's, it's hard to look at a slope and, and see and try to guess how steep it is. Um, you can, it's now you can just use the cell phone app and it's either on your compass, it might be already on a part of your compass app or you might have to download it, but you can just use your cell phone. Uh, you can use your ski poles. So this is something I do oftentimes. So if you put this tip of the left pole on the snow and hold it vertical, and then you put this tip of the um, pole on the snow and hold it horizontal and you, if the two, if the horizontal pole bisects exactly in the middle of the vertical pole, that slope is 27 degrees. So a quick and easy way of determining if you're under 30 degrees. So and I, I'll use that, um, you know, frequently just to um, remind myself. So here's an example of a train trap. I took this picture uh, Sunday in uh, Newton Canyon. So here's a picture of an avalanche, a very tiny, tiny one. I kicked this off when I skied across here. And it's very small, and the consequence is nothing down here. But if this were on top of a creek or on top of a tree well and knocked somebody off their feet, that would be what we call a train trap. So, so a very small avalanche. Uh, this is, I think, the same day. So this is uh, two of my uh, mountain rescue friends. And so this, I don't know how well you can see this, but Meredith here is standing on a very safe spot. Ron is skiing down in a very low angle spot, but this one little spot here that we had to cross uh, was somewhat steep and it kicked off this little tiny slide right here. So and this is just a few days ago. This was four or five inches of wind blown on top of a very firm, hard crust. Looks like we might be having some technical difficulties with Chris. Let's see if we can get him to join back. Uh -huh. Oh no, it looks like we might have lost Chris. Uh -huh.
Hey, it looks like we're back. I don't know what happened. I don't know either. Kicked you off. <laughs> Do we still have our whole crew? Uh, we should be good. Yeah. Okay. yeah everyone's still here waiting okay. patiently. Okay. I don't, yeah, I don't know what happened. Let me, um, let me just pull open my, um, my presentation and it'll be just a second here. Sure. And then I'm almost finished and I can take questions now or later one. Perfect. Yeah, if I anyone has questions, we can start queuing them up in the Q&A. Okay. Now, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're almost done. So I'll wrap it up here. Um, human warning signs. I, I uh, thank you everybody for being patient. I'm not sure what happened. Um, I don't, I don't like the word heuristics, but I wanted to put that in there because that's what you're going to see if you in the avalanche literature and in the avalanche books, you may see that. But basically, what this is is decision shortcuts. It's when we just sort of jump to conclusions or we just don't bother to think things through. And these happen uh, in places besides just avalanche. Uh, avalanches, but this is an example of what decision shortcuts are. So familiar, familiarity, I ski this all the time, and you just let your guard down and you don't think about avalanches consistently. I've never seen this slide. Acceptance, this happens lots in groups, right? You might think, oh, Van Tilburg doesn't, must know what he's doing, it must be okay. So people in groups tend to not question authority or question leader, question um, the person who has more skill. And so that's uh, an important, you know, shortcut that we do. Expert halo, it can't happen to me. Scarcity, we never get snow like this in Oregon. It must be, we gotta ski it, right? That happens a lot to myself included. And then social facility, I see this a lot on the south side of Mount Hood. That other group is going up, it must be okay. I see people climbing up the old chute, must be okay. So here's a great article that was written by John Branch that was in the New York Times about the avalanche at Tunnel Creek that talks a lot about the human factors and group dynamics. It's really good if you wanna read about it. Uh, okay, so let's put it all together, safe uphill travel. Avoid steep, steep slopes if it's dangerous. Spread out and ski one at a time. Uh, avoid open slopes and gullies. Stick to ridges and areas of steep uh, and, th and thick trees. Cross, don't cross slopes in the middle. Try to be high or low to be on the safe side and avoid cornices. Once every year or two, we get an avalanche that comes from somebody who broke a cornice. That happened to, I think, with a, that was the one of the av avalanches that happened in the Wallawas several years ago uh, with an avalanche expert, uh, cornice broke and fell. So here's Newton Canyon again. This is just from a few days ago. So you're, if, when you go up Newton Canyon, this is out of bounds of Mount Hood Meadows, you're going on a ridge. And then when you're at the bottom of Newton and you're skiing up some difficult terrain, we picked our exit to climb back out on a low angle slope and skied it one at a time. So, uh, and we're spreading out and crossing the slope. So that's the kind of thing you need to be thinking about, about uphill travel. Same with downhill. Low angle slopes, there's, you can have a lot of fun on low angle slopes if it's dangerous. Uh, I use islands of safety. So what this means, if there's a cluster of trees or a cluster of rocks or a ridge and you ski a slope, the first person down wants to get out of the avalanche um, path and be on a safe island, okay? So stay in voice and visual contact, ride one at a time and use a spotter. Um, stay within your skill level so people get into trouble when they're skiing in terrain that's uh, over their skill level. And then use the correct tool. And what I mean by this is, you know, if you're going to try to ski uh, 
pearly gates left off the summit of Mount Hood, you're going to want to use a different type of ski than if you're going to ski uh, deep powder um, that's um, somewhere else like uh, Pocket Creek. So uh, just make sure that you have the correct tool. And if you're a snowboarder and you're on snowshoes, you have to keep in mind that your travel is going to be different than uh, skiers if you're with a mixed group. So here's an example of skiing safely. This is um, coming down Newton Canyon. We've got these rocks up here, which are sort of anchoring this section of slope up here. So we were a lot less concerned about this. And then we're skiing this one at a time and I'm down here in these trees. The avalanche path run out is right down here. So I'm sort of out of the way. This is a low angle slope. This is about 30 degrees, but I'm still out of the way practicing good habits. This, you may have seen this, this I got off social media. This is an avalanche, I think just from two days ago. This is in the White River Headwall, and this took a skier, uh, no injuries, but this is the White River Headwall. I skied this about a week ago, but we started about from where this picture was taken, and we intentionally didn't ski this up here, but this just was from, um, I think, Sunday. If you have to get rescued, um, you really have to rely on your companion. So the first thing you have to do is try not to go down. If you're caught in a slide, stay on your feet and try to um, try to grab a tree if you can. And if you're gonna go down, um, fight to stay near the surface and pull an airbag ripcord. If you're buried, um, it's really critical to make a pocket, an air pocket in front of your face so you're face doesn't have snow against it and your airways clear. This is a picture of an inbound avalanche at uh, Silver uh, Mountain in Northern Idaho that happened last year. Caught I think five or six people and three died. But one of the guys who was buried out alive said he watched an avalanche safety class kind of like this and remembered to clear snow out from uh, his face when he when the snow stopped moving when he was buried. And so that's really critical is to keep your airway open. Um, and then um, finally, if you have to rescue your partner, um, this is, it's, it's difficult and you've got to practice this. So this is on the left side, this is Portland Mountain Rescue and Hood River Craig Rats uh, doing an avalanche rescue training. And this is very difficult even with a lot of people who know what they're doing um, and so uh, please practice with your stuff this is a this is a sort of a guide to what happens in an avalanche rescue if there's only two people and one person's caught then you don't need to establish leadership necessarily but you have to first make sure nobody else gets hurt and then you do basically a surface search and a transceiver search at the same time so you don't want to miss somebody who's got a hand sticking out of their of their of the snow while you're trying to get your transceiver out if somebody's not fully buried. But at the same time, this all has to happen very quickly. So you find somebody with a transceiver and then you use a probe, which is that uh, two or three meter uh, collapsible probe and to try to pinpoint somebody under the snow. And then you start shoveling and shoveling is, can be very difficult. Every time I do an avalanche rescue drill, I just remember how hard it is to shovel. It's it's a challenging, you have to sort of know what you're doing. And it seems kind of odd because you should just be able to shovel snow like you're digging your car out in the morning. But you have to tunnel in from the side and you have to um, make sure you don't miss somebody, right? So that's the real reason you have a probe. Um, this black piece on the side here, emergency services notification, this is the one time where you're maybe not gonna call 911 instantly. Um, which most emergencies we tell people call 911, but this is the one time where you might not call 911 instantly because we don't want you getting out your phone, wait until you get cell service. If you're on the north side of Mount Hood, there's a chance you might get 911 dispatch in Skamania County. They've got to transfer you to Hood River County. So you get the idea. It's, we don't want you to delay rescuing your partner. Um, the last I just want to mention, it's not related, it's related to avalanches, but it's different than avalanches is tree wells. So um, there's more hazards than just avalanches out there. You can be safe, but be careful about falling into uh, tree wells. Okay, so that's it. Thanks. Sorry for the uh, brief intermission there, interruption, but I really appreciate the chance to talk. This is Portland Mountain Rescue's website, and I'm happy to um, chat. Um, answer any questions yeah it looks like we had a couple come through in the chat 
Uh, one question was, is it safer to stick to the ski track of the person in front? Uh, probably. I mean, if somebody's in front of you and um, making a safe ski track uphill in a safe area, it might, it's probably somewhat safer because it's already being compacted a little bit. So probably. And then someone else asked, can you go over how to check the slope angle with your poles again? Oh yeah, so you take uh, one pole and you put it vertical with the tip on the, on the snow. And then the other pole horizontal and put the tip on the snow and then put the handle next to the um, snow or next to the other pole. Does that make sense? I think so. Do you have your pole marked so that like depending on like where it hits for that? I don't, but, it's, but if you mark your pole exactly in the middle, uh, okay. then you you will know if the slope is 30 degrees or less. So you just okay. mark one pole in the middle, exactly in the middle, and put those two poles together at perpendicular, and that'll be 27 degrees or less. Okay. Um, how much better is a three antenna beacon versus an older two antenna model? Worth upgrading my old beacon if it's still functioning well? uh absolutely it's worth upgrading yeah the three antenna beacons um you know the the new beacons they don't they they are digitally processed and they work along magnetic flux lines and so they give you direction and distance and so like you turn on your beacon it'll say you know go nine meters that direction and so with the third antenna it's going to be more accurate and, um, and really what you want in the new beacons is the marking function if there's a multiple burial so what are your preferred snowpack tests when you when do you use them and how do you evaluate the results it's a layer well question. yeah that's a tough question i i do um you know i do some kind of snowpack test almost every tour i use my ski pole a lot upside down and i'll do a, a quick pit with the handle of my ski pole and I'll just um, dig into the snow. I'll find out where the crust is. And usually once a tour, I'll dig a pit, but it's a very fast pit. Um, either I'll dig it or my buddies will dig it and we'll use a shovel, but uh, I'll dig a pit. And mostly what I look for, I mostly do the shovel shear test. And I don't have time to explain that, but that's usually what I do. And I usually mostly interested less, I'm less interested in the stability test but I'm most interested in what the layers look like throughout the season. Uh, do cell phones interfere with beacons? Oh yeah, good question. Absolutely. So there's been some research on this. We The best guesstimate that we have using some data is that your cell phone and beacon should be 20 centimeters apart. Ideally, your cell phone turned off, but um, so that's why I keep my beacon in my left front pocket and my cell phone and my radio on my chest harness, or I, if I don't have a radio i'll keep my cell phone in a chest pocket in my jacket and so um 20 centimeters is what we recommend and yeah there's absolutely uh, beacons can be interfered with a diabetic insulin pump can interfere with it a radio can interfere with it oh, yeah oh wow um and question in the q and a's if the heather canyon sign says closed is newton canyon slash pea gravel ridge still accessible yeah, so you can uh, heather a pea gravel, Newton Canyon and pea gravel ridge are out of bounds. So okay. the forest, forest service lets you go into those. So you can ski up pea gravel ridge if um, heather canyon is closed. Okay. Um, I think you kind of answered this before, but I've read various opinions about replacing beacons at certain yearly intervals. Some people say beacons should get replaced every five years, while others say since the technology went digital, it doesn't need replaced. Thoughts? I would say, you know, a beacon is, uh, like I said, it's a little computer. So um, there, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with them. I would say five years, it should be replaced because technology's better. There are, most of the companies will allow you to upgrade the firmware and the beacons, and, but it's a lot of com companies you have to send the beacon back in to get that done. But um, 
I mean, the tolerances on the frequency can drift. Um, the electronics can start failing. I, I, yeah, I would say I wouldn't trust my life on a five-year-old beacon. Okay. Um, we had someone ask, do you recommend wearing a beacon in traditional mountaineering or just in ski mountaineering and touring? Uh, well, I would recommend wearing a beacon anytime you're worried about avalanches. I mean, we do get avalanches in climbers. I think the stats I showed you, they were, um, uh, climbers were uh, the third most common group to get caught in avalanches or the fourth. So I would say if you're in avalanche terrain, you should have a beacon. When, if ever, do you perform a ski cut prior to skiing a slope? Um, I, I almost never perform, well, uh, infrequently, because generally I feel like if I'm performing a ski cut in order to determine if the slope is safe enough to ski, I shouldn't be there. And the same with digging a big ski pit or doing the large ski pit test called the Roish block. I just feel like if I'm doing that, I probably shouldn't be there. But once in a while, if I'm with a couple people and we just need to get down a short slope, I'll, I'll do a ski cut. But there's an, uh, you may know there's an ax, uh, avalanche accident inbounds at Mount Hood Meadows on a ski patroller, very experienced ski patroller last year and got caught in an avalanche at God's Wall from a ski cut. Um, how often does Portland Mountain Rescue take on new volunteers? Our recruiting, I think, is every other year. And so every other year we have a academy of um, rookies. Okay. Um, can you put together and share a list of your favorite websites to check for weather and snowpack conditions? It'd be helpful to look at. And so that yeah. we can all bookmark them. Yeah, if you yeah. send that to me, I can send that out to anyone that okay. was on the webinar. Um, what are good ways for Portland area backcountry skiing newbies and net to network and connect with experienced folks to go out and explore? Um, that's a tough one. That's uh, I would say taking a class or joining a club or group is probably the best way. Either the Mazamas or um, uh, they're kind of a climbing club that does ski outings um, or. Um, taking a class and you'll meet other people. Uh, there are some quite a few social media groups. I follow several social media groups. I don't know how easy it is to meet partners on those, but I see frequently people reaching out saying, hey, I'm, I need a partner, which is probably good. You know, it's like better to have a partner to go with. You have to be a little cautious when you get to know them first, but I, I mean, social media or, or an outdoor club. Um, someone said, also, I rarely bring my helmet with me ski touring. I know I should, but it's really warm and heavy. Sometimes I wear my rock climbing helmet because it's lighter. What is the UL styrofoam helmet you said that you use? I want to get one. So hopefully I start wearing a helmet more often. Yeah. So the helmet I use is made by Camp. It's the um, uh, Italian company. And, you, and the other popular one that I have friends that use is made by... Um, uh, Petzl has a ski mountaineering helmet, I believe. And so um, the, the, they're basically styrofoam, but the reason they'll, they'll take uh, at least somewhat of a rock hit to the head is the one I have has a little trapeze in the helmet. So it absorbs more force than a, um, than a standard like styrofoam bike helmet. So the one I have is CAMP, C-A-M-P. And then it's my understanding that the U.S. doesn't recognize like ski mountaineering certified helmets, but some brands will advertise as ski mountaineering helmets or like say that they're rated for that. Yeah, yeah. that's I, yeah, that's probably true. I don't know exactly how that works. I know that um, the ones in the U.S. to be rated for climbing have to take a rock on the top of the helmet that's kind of mm -hmm. one of the tests that um, has to pass right sure um any suggestions for good guide services to get experience with in backcountry terrain in northern oregon and southern washington 
Well, I don't, the, the main one I know of is um, Timberline Mountain Guides, and they have a sister company that is a thing called Oregon Backcountry Ski Guides, and I've done um, three tours uh, with the owner, um, Pete Keen, and they're a great company, um, but I don't want to just promote one company. There's sure there's others, but that's the one I know of because I know that it's Timberline Mountain Guides, but their sister company is Oregon Ski Guides, and they do ski tours. Uh, and they do classes and they do them in um, a little bit on Mount Hood and a lot then. Yeah, they do airy courses as well. So I right. Can airy one with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Calf Adventures might also do some ski touring. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sure there's other ones, yeah. Yeah. Um, you touched on this earlier, but can you speak more about where it's safe to carry your beacon? Would you carry it in a zippered pant pocket? Yeah, so um, the official recommendation is carry it in the harness that it comes with because then it's next to your body and it's protected. And then you don't, you know, if you're taking, you know, if it's in a jacket pocket, you take off the jacket, that's a problem. But because of the cell phone interference and because I'm oftentimes wearing a radio harness and a backpack, I wear mine in my left front pocket. And as long as it's a sewn zippered pocket and you have the beacon tethered, that's generally felt to be acceptable. If it's a glued on pocket, it's not acceptable. And if it's not tethered, um, so some pants now come with a beacon tether in the thigh pocket, or you can just, you know, tether it to a belt loop. Um, it, if you're gonna, if the op only option is to wear it in the harness on the outside of your base layer, I would say put it in your backpack and cinch your backpack on. But that's, that's probably not, best place to put it in your backpack, but certainly it's not good outside your base layer. So anyway, so I keep mine in my left front pocket. Okay. Um, I used to use mountain forecast for the mountain temperatures in Southern California and the Sierras. However, it consistently proved to be highly inaccurate compared to NOAA. Uh, is mountain forecast more effective in the Pacific Northwest? I don't think so. I think they have an algorithm and they probably use the NOAA temperatures as part of the algorithm. But yeah, so I look at NOAA or the National Weather Service primarily for temperatures. And I kind of look at the mountain forecast as more of an adjunct, but that I don't think it's any more accurate probably than your experience in California because they probably use the same algorithm for everything. Um, how accurate do you feel the slope angle shading in apps like Caltopo are? Um, uh, they're probably not very accurate and I mean I don't I don't know enough about I have CalTopo and I use the SAR Topo which is the same program but with a little different functionality but I, I don't know enough about it but the the I, I think you know a avalanche slope a, a significant a, a, a avalanche that can cause significant hazard to you can occur on a 10 or 15 foot slope, and that's not gonna show up on CalTopo. So I think for a general overall picture of the terrain, it's probably a good idea, but I don't think it's gonna be, I don't think you're gonna be able to look at CalTopo and say, there's nothing over 30 degrees, let's ski it. Sure. Um, kind of related to the mountain forecast question, does mountain forecast change based on the mountains as on the mountain aspect? Um, no, I don't think so. Because if you look at Mount Hood, you're the mountain forecast in Mount Hood, you've got, you can look at four different elevations, but it doesn't give you aspect. Okay. Uh, this may be a silly question. In regards to gear, what do you recommend when you're out with children? Should every member of your family have their own set of gear? Well, that gets expensive. So when my kids were little, um, I took them out several times. Um, and in fact, I still have a pair of uh, ski mountaineering adapters that are um, uh, for kids. But I think um, if you can't get avalanche gear for everybody, you have to not be in avalanche terrain. And so uh, that's really the only responsible thing to do. And if you want to get your kids out and you want to get an avalanche train, you have to have gear for everybody. And know how to use it. And know how to use it, yeah. Um, have you ever personally been caught in a slide? I've been caught in several small slides, but nothing that's ever caught, 
taken me off my feet and nothing ever substantial. Oh, this might be a uh, personal question. What's your favorite ski tour area around Mount Hood? <laughs> the 5,000 to 7,000 range and not higher. <laughs> Secret question. You yeah, can give your so, public answer. Yeah, yeah. I ski uh, all, all the time. I ski the Vista Ridge Meadows, uh, partly because I work at Mount Hood Meadows, and when I'm working up there, I can ski it. And it's oftentimes it's very safe, and it's a good snow. So the Vista Ridge Meadows are the south rope line of Mount Hood Meadows, and there's a lot of terrain back in there: um, Green Apple Creek and White River. So, and, and so I ski that a lot. I ski um, the south side, like everybody, I ski the north side, which isn't my favorite. Um, Pocket Creek is really great, but it just doesn't uh, get, get in, get snow on it until later in the season. But probably, probably the Vista Ridge Meadows are a great place to go for um, people just starting out. Uh, and then they also asked, have you ever skied Bonnie Meadows via Bennett Pass? Um, I've skied a couple of shots in Bennett Pass down to Highway 26, but I don't think I've ever skied to Bonnie Meadows. Okay. Uh, best places to practice locally to get used to, used to touring while waiting for your Area 1 training. Um, well, right now, there's a lot of people that just go up to Cooper Spur Ski Area on the north side above Parkdale. That's a pretty good spot. Um, the south side of Mount Hood is generally pretty safe if you don't go above Palmer. Um, if you, There's a lot of people up there, and it's safe terrain. Um, the third spot would be Tilly Jane, which is as long as you're not going into Doe Creek or, or Palali, and you're just kind of staying on the main Tilly Jane Trail and skiing the trees off the trail, that's a pretty good spot that's pretty safe. All right. Um, is there a site that collects and reports information on accidents and avalanches on Mount Hood? Uh, no. There's a, there's a national site uh, that's run by the Colorado Avalanche Center. They, they keep the national stats. Um, but there's no, they, they just keep avalanche data. And if they don't, if nobody calls it in, nobody, um, we don't ever know about it. So unfortunately there's no, there's no spot. Like the, maybe the only one I think that was reported this year was the one in, um, oh gosh, was it May on the Luthold, the avalanche that Portland Mountain Rescue and, and Craig Rats went on. I think that one got reported, but that's about it. Does NWAC report anything or keep track of any of that? Not unless they hear about it. I mean, if they hear about it, then then NWAC will decide if it's significant enough to report it. But um, but generally, they don't um, keep track of anything unless it's significant. Okay. Um, and then along those same lines, I've seen stuff on like social media. And so maybe if you want to include in that list of websites, also some different groups that you oh, yeah. follow or look at, that might be helpful for people yeah. as well. Um. I'd like to take an AVI refresher course. My training is from the late 80s and 90s before ARI existed and included companion, rescue, snowpack analysis, classroom and field. Which ARI level would be best to consider for a refresher course? Start at level with level one at the beginning or go to an ARI level two? I would say you could probably go to an ARI level two. I mean, I think you, if you've got a foundation, uh, it might be, more use of your time to have more advanced training because part of level two is going to be review anyway. Um, there are a couple companies I think that offer like a one day refresher, I think, or they used to, but they might not anymore. But I, I, I think you could, you probably want to discuss that with Avalanche instructor, but I think a level two would probably be okay. What are your thoughts on the Peeps DPS Sport Beacon Potential Recall? <laughs> um, I sent my personal one back and I sent the two um, mountain rescue ones back so um, I would say it's you know it's I would say if you have one and Black Diamond's willing to warranty it I would get a new beacon okay 
Um, can you recommend a good route finding education book or website? I can think of one book. <laughs> yeah. Can I promote my own book here? <laughs> yeah, we sell it at Mountain Shop. We're fully stocked. Yeah. yeah, so you can get my book. I wrote a backcountry ski guide book to Oregon, and that's at the Mountain Shop. Uh, there's a there's a, a guy who has a website that's – I really like it. It hasn't been updated in years, but I think it's called uh, SkiMountaineer.com. That's a list of ski routes on the volcanoes uh, for spring tours and, and spring and summer volcano climbing. Um, but those are, there's one other one. And let's see, there's a guy that used to live in Oregon that now lives in Utah that has a website that has some ski tours on Mount Hood. And I'll, I don't remember the name of the website right now. If you think Mount of it, Hood. you can add it to the list. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, there it is. Oh, mountainlessons.com. Uh, somebody popped it up. That's it. Yeah. Mountainlessons.com. Okay. Uh, what is your preferred method for ripping skins off skis and storing them? Any tips for effective transitions, efficient transitions? Yeah. So that's a great question. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm really fast because I, I ski all the time. And, um, so one thing I'm religious about is I only take, I, I, if I'm taking my skis off, I peel my skins off without taking my ski off. So I'll either cross my legs or I'll push my ski tip back up to my back and peel it off. I usually cross my legs because if I, if I cross one leg over my knee, I can lock my DenaFit binding, I can lock my Scarpa boot, and I can rip my skin all in one. And then I stomp down and I'm ready to ski. And then I take the other skin off. And I always stick my skins together. One, I take one skin in half and stick it and put it in my jacket pot in my jacket. And I stick the other skin and put it in my jacket. Uh, the only time I put them in my backpack is if I'm for sure gonna be done uphill skiing for the day. But I keep them in my in my in my jacket so they stay warm and they dry out a bit and also just so I'm ready to go again. So sometimes I get to the bottom of the slope, I want up to even take my pack off. I just put my skins on. And I don't ever take, I only take one ski off at a time. And mostly that's for two reasons. Mostly that's for glacier skiing because it's safer if you're skiing the glaciers in the spring and summer, you know, you don't, you want to always have one ski on at a time for crevasse safety. And in deep snow, it's, you know, you take both skis off and you sink down to your crotch. It's just, you can't walk. So I just out of habit, just to always have one ski on at all times. You can't put your skins on with your skis on? You're not? No, I'm not, not that good. Yeah. No. I would love to see if someone could do that. Yeah. Um, does PMR require medical training before accepting volunteers? What do you look for in choosing volunteers? So um, uh, PMR does not, you, you don't have to, you don't have to have, it's not a prerequisite to have medical. The minimum medical required is um, a f first aid and CPR card, but most people at a minimum at PMR are, are wilderness first responders. So we like to have, and that's like a, I want to say it's about a 80 hour class, takes about a week and uh, that's ideal. Um, but probably the most important thing is mountain skills and a love of the mountain and willing to participate. You know, I mean, when I say participate, I mean getting out of bed at two in the morning and driving an hour into a storm and hiking all night. And so that's really a key factor. Um, and then the final question, what is a ski cut? Oh, a ski cut is if you, if you have a slope that looks like it might be dangerous uh, or avalanche prone, and you don't wanna ski the entire slope, you can make one crossing of the slope with your skis maybe 10, 15, 20 feet from maybe a cornice to a tree or so you kind of test it out. You ski across it and then stop and see what happens. And if you kick off, you know, an avalanche, then you know it's unsafe. Maybe don't ski it. <laughs> right. All right. Well, if there, oh, does PMR accept split borders or just skiers? Yeah, I think, yeah, PMR will take split borders, yeah. And uh, a lot of our rescues are skis, but many of them are not. Many of them are through the, you know, on boots, boots on the ground, so.
Yeah, sure. All right. Well, I think that just about wraps it up for tonight's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us, Christopher, and putting all this together. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry about the technical glitch in the middle. No worries. We needed an intermission, bathroom break, get some refreshments. Um, and like Christopher mentioned earlier, uh, and a lot of the gear we re he recommended is available at Mountain Shop. We're offering a three-day avalanche rental package for $30 and a 30-day avalanche rental package for $109. So if you're not ready to invest in all the gear or you want to try it out and figure out if you like the Tracker 3 beacons, that's what we have in stock. Um, and then I will send an email to the winner of the three-day avalanche rental package with instructions on how to redeem it. Um, and yeah, we hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation and learned a lot so you can stay safe when you're recreating outside in avalanche terrain. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Have a good evening. And yeah, thanks again for joining us. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks.